So let's get the thoughts of Anastasia and George. And uh, we're going to a, a smaller right-hand column for your start, aren't we? Which is that President Assad could stay in power in Syria. Why so? This is a very important story, and I think it's uh, a big development if this comes to fruition. A De good Daily Telegraph story, which says that the president of Russia, Putin, is preparing to take part in attacks uh, on Islamic State uh, in Syria in return for leaving uh, President uh, Assad in power. And Russia has already sent dozens of helicopter gunships and fighter jets to Syria as it steps up its support for Assad. And this is a really important sort of moment in this whole saga because it leaves us in the West with a slightly bittersweet moment. On, on the one hand, we, we want any support in trying to tackle uh, fundamental terrorism and, uh, and, and ISIS because, of course, the threat that they pose to us here in the UK and right across the world. Uh, but on the other hand, of course, Russia has not been a great partner. Uh, there are great diplomatic uh, problems. And, of course, we don't want Assad to be in power. It feels to me as if we probably have no choice but to help uh, to, to accept Putin's help and work with him. Uh, there'll be real sort of operational complexities and difficulties, but it, it can be uh, coped with. It's perhaps an opportunity. But at the same time, we're not leading in this. Some people will be critical of the fact that this shows we don't have a strategy and we're having to follow where others are leading. So, so, and that's not a great position. So for operational us. complexities. Are you saying that we would have to liaise with the Russian Air Force about where they were they, where they were targeting? And for we, sure. You'd have to you'd have to simply work together. For sure. But I mean that's not new. I mean the Russian military has worked alongside NATO mm. for many years in uh, in sort of military exercises. But not with the background of Ukraine. For no, example. no, no, of course not. And that's what makes it very, very complex and mm. difficult. Um, um, but military people are fantastically resourceful and clever and they can make things happen. It will be complex. Some people will say this is an opportunity to try and create fresh relationships with Russia. That's very important. Mm. This is, I mean, geopolitics in its most confused state. I mean, this is really serious mm. in terms of what sort of message it's giving to an endorsement to a regime, which, frankly, you know, why is it still there, never mind the fact that this is going to allow continuity? I mean, let's not forget the dynamics, actually, of the Assad regime in what's happened with ISIS and people joining jihadism in the first place. There definitely is a relationship there. There's a lot of people who still feel that a lack of, an, basically, action on the part of the West in terms of intervention in Syria to do with Assad has really fueled some of the movements that we've seen then further and a lot of the jihaz jihadism gaining momentum. So, I mean, this is, this is such a confused story in many ways. I mean, the idea of now getting behind somebody who is actually supporting the literally the leader in a game that we were terribly against initially is, I mean, it's mind-boggling. While yeah. you're still giving arms to some of the forces fighting here, yeah. of course. Exactly. But if you're a Western leader, you ask yourself the question, do I want to keep Islamic State or do I want to keep Assad? And it be becomes sort of more of a straightforward decision, doesn't it, really, or not? Yes, no, it does become a, it's a question of priorities in the end. And uh, ISIS is the biggest fundamental problem facing everybody mm. right now and that has to be dealt with mm. but but straight after that you know it's not it's not like a silver bullet there will always be complexities and it's not a perfect situation i have to say about this story there is no uh, sort of central fact here of, of mm -hmm. proof or mm -hmm. confirmation. No great sourcing. Uh, no gr there may well be sourcing somewhere, but there's no obvious source as to the... Oh, and it seems yeah. like it's the only paper which is carrying this story. It, it, it does, definitely. But there's still the, the, the message that isn't coming out of that story is this idea of why inaction was so important. Yeah. I've moved on to uh, to the pictures of the Hajj, their tragedy at the Hajj. More than 700 dead, 850 injured in the crash. They say that that death toll may well rise, of course. Um, difficult for the newspapers to get the right tone and the right pictures of this story, isn't it? The, it the is. Times is carrying a, it is. a more graphic picture. It is. It, I mean, it, it, it's trying to, I think, demonstrate the scale of the tragedy, but also to put it into the context of what it was, which was you know, something which is very important in a huge world religion and something which has turned into a tragedy on an unprecedented scale. And of course, it's now turning from the human tragedy onto why did this happen? What was the infrastructure that perhaps wasn't there for this to happen? I mean, we've seen tragedies related to this happen in the past but never to this scale and serious serious questions need to be asked not simply because of this particularly awful situation but because this is an annual event and there are huge risks around such large numbers of people getting together and it seems that it isn't being tackled in the way that and it should the be. And the recriminations certainly from the Iranians um, one report that more than a hundred of those 
dead are in fact from Iran. Um, despite the massive investment by the Saudis in, as you say, this annual pilgrimage, which is the, the greatest convergence of human beings on Earth. Well, so, it's uh, also only a few weeks ago that 100 people died in the same spot when a crane collapsed, which was a part of the building up to this week. So. Yeah. Um, but the story you have chosen uh, on The Guardian's front page is about Jeremy Corbyn. Negative poll ratings, we're told, of minus three for his first poll, which is the lowest of any incoming Labour leader, but uh, too early to, to get rid, according to Mandelson. Peter Mandelson, uh, who is a, a person who is not a friend of the Labour Party these days, and he'd be the first to boast that, um, but he's done uh, an interview with The Guardian where he's basically said um, there is no point in the Labour movement trying to ditch Jeremy Corbyn until the British public have made it clear that they're not going to vote for him. It's almost handing the power here to the British public. To what, to the next lot of local elections or something, or what? Well, probably opinion polls, okay. but it may get to May, uh, if, if you can get last that long. And, and oh. Anastasia and I were talking about this earlier on, and, and that's pretty much why you think that some people, may even be you, uh, <laughs> supported Corbyn in this Labour leadership election, precisely to drag the party to such a car crash, to force it to come to its senses, <laughs> before realising how far it's gone, before it can find a leader who's much more electable. There are so many parts of this story. I mean, this is about um, the mandate, the democratic mandate. I mean, if somebody is elected, and it wasn't just through backdoor means, it was entirely democratic, then you do have to accept that. And I think, actually, the, the messages from the Labour Party coming out recently have been very worrying. They need to accept that mandate and deal with it. And dealing with it is coming up with alternative messages if they don't actually support their leader, but also respecting that leadership and seeing what happens next. And I think that a lot of this trajectory that's happening now only seems to reflect what was happening with the Labour Party that was making things go wrong. They weren't learning from lessons from the past. They weren't looking, I think, insightfully enough into what went wrong with Miliband, and they're still not doing that. And we need to find out with the Labour Party what the problem is, why people didn't find that Ed Miliband was resonating with their interests, and why actually a lot of party members then felt they wanted to go to the extreme left. I think the people matter in opinion polls. Because there's the such a tiny bunch do. of people people is a proportionately it's a minuscule number of people who are madly drawn to totally unworkable Marxist policies which but, are frankly a joke but I think and that, but there's a much more important thing in this if you go and talk to people who are not interested in politics yeah. about Jeremy Corbyn a lot of them actually do think probably don't agree with the man in fact I don't really know much about the man and perhaps I think his foreign policy ideas are crackers but He's different. Now, why is one man who, let's face it, isn't the most charismatic person around of such interest to people? It's because he is different and because people are very bored of this carbon cookie cut, whatever you want to call it, cut out version. I think do you, do you, this do you is think absolute it's... nonsense. The fact that, that David Cameron romped home and uh, defied all the polls with he didn't romp home, did he? He romped he home, from, home from the position he was in. Wow, that's he had else. an astonishing mountain to climb and he did it. That tells you that the British public are actually interested in a serious person for serious times and he did uh, and, and uh, not but, interested but, but in But that was several months ago. People. Do you not think the election of Jeremy Corbyn has given the left a new confidence? No, I absolutely reject that 100%. The left cannot stand Jeremy Corbyn. The ultra left the flotsam and jetsam, the ragtag Marxists, who are true. actually are not really real interested in policy at from all. Your position. <laughs> exactly. They are <laughs> not the interested in policy at all. <laughs> they are buoyed, but the serious people of the left and the, and the centre-left mm. are absolutely but the heartbroken. the point is, the thing that I really find surprising is that Labour, the, the, the Labour Party members who are not keen on Corbyn are not thinking, OK, what is it that people think is refreshing about him? Yeah. All they what seem do, to who, want to who do is... Who are these people who think that he's refreshing? The people in the street that you're not talking to, apparently. They, they couldn't care less, the people in the street. We are talking about true. a tiny We've majority, so minority people. of people. A tiny minority, that a handful of people, uh, you know... It, proportionally, who have backed Jeremy Corbyn. That's different. I'm not talking about people who voted for him. I'm not talking yeah. about party members. I'm talking about people out there in the street who are not probably, let's face it, voting for anybody. They see a guy, though, who they've gathered, for example, at Prime Minister's Questions, is not doing the what usual... What evidence have you got that the man in the street has even taken notice? By talking to the man notice? in the street. Have you talked to anybody recently in the street? I rarely talk to people in the I street. hate to point out to you, but we're not getting through your list at Sorry, all. Sorry, yes, no. <laughs> um, or to George at all. No, exactly. I'm just going to show you the sun, which we had not seen before.
VW scandal spreads to Europe. We're fuming. Pollution tests on cars in the UK. Coming back with that and the rest of the things they've chosen to talk about after this short break. Well, he's had a great five days uh, tour in China, lots of news announcements every day, and that's all great for empowering him as a figure. He really is the uh, sort of the man who should be the next prime minister, all things being equal. Um, however, what he's, what's interesting today is that he's told the FT on the way back from China that he plans a uh, an industry tour of Iran mm. next year. Now that's really interesting. To their nuclear facilities, perhaps. <laughs> well, you know, this is this is a man who's saying, I am positioning myself as a risk taker. Mm. I am putting myself out there to take gambles, calculated gambles, rather than a safe pair of hands. I now need to mm. step up and demonstrate to the political world and the outside world that I'm a figure to be reckoned with on the world stage because he does want to be the Prime Minister of this country when David Cameron stands down. He says we can either sit on the sidelines or we can get out there and plant our flag in the ground. And you know, the fact is there is emerging markets everywhere and there are interesting places like Iran which do pose us real uh, issues and challenges diplomatically and, and all the rest of it militarily. However, if you don't go out and try and make business, then you know you're not you're not going to grow the economy. Mm. He's, I mean, it's interesting because George Osborne, I think, is making a very clear "I am taking a risk" signposting on him. Uh, but actually, this is, for me, more interesting about Iran. I mean, this is about Iran taking on a very different position on the world stage. It's less about countries risk-taking in relation to Iran and more about the temperament having changed in terms of engagement, moving away from this isolationist approach, basically. So less Iran. about Osborne, the more about Iran as well. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And that's tremendously significant because we're not actually just talking about Iran, a very large country with huge geopolitical implications. We're also talking about a region that could be affected. And the political side of things in Iran, so something that's referred to that critics may be worried about, Osborne, why is he actually engaging in business levels uh, with a country which has a hugely problematic mm. regime in terms of uh, records on human rights, etc.? Some argue that actually engaging on a business level with Iran is the answer mm. to enabling more democracy. Yeah, just very quickly before we take a break, another story that uh, you wanted to get to now. Um, anger as Downton's first scouser is betrayed as a thief. Why has it taken four days to get to this? I couldn't believe <laughs> I, it. I, I, this, I, I to totally say. agree. This has been raging on Twitter, yeah. social media for days. You think even you would be all the, over the papers on Monday? Uh, even during the programme on yeah. Sunday night. I know you don't watch television, uh, Anastasia, so you won't <laughs> like, expect oh, yeah. Downton is nothing for you. But <laughs> I'm the too basic the point the is yeah. the first uh, Liverpoolian character ever on Downton Abbey, yeah. uh, and it turns out and she's, she's a criminal. Uh, yeah. She's a wrong one, and people are really upset yeah. that this is sort of pigeonholing. Are there yeah. no other regional people on? There are, people. but, but there yeah. are, the, this is the first it was the, scouser. It was the scouser part of it yeah. that was the problematic. Anyway, uh, we wanted to get to that one quickly. Lots more still to come, including why your mobile phone bill may be about to rise. Back in a moment. And The Guardian, it's too early to force out uh, the leader, says Mandelson, the leader, of course, of the Labour Party. Absolutely. And here we're hearing Mandelson saying that actually people need to wake up to the issues that they're seeing around the Corbyn leadership and, crucially, the bit that I mind so much about, the reflection of why Corbyn came to power and that not enough is being thought about that and that you do need to wait for a reaction on the implications and it can't just be a question of trying to get Corbyn mm -hmm. out now. There is a mandate, which isn't really what Mandelson's talking about, but that's mm -hmm. what I think, and it needs to be a question of getting the timing right and, crucially, having alternative messages, which is not what we're hearing enough of. Anastasia Deville, George Pascoe-Watson, good to see you both, thank you.